welcome back Dr. David Pacini, who has led us so well these Wednesdays of Lent. And we have more art and salvation story to learn tonight. Welcome back, my friend. It's a pleasure to be back. The contest with Doc continues. I put on a tie, he put on Joseph's coat of many colors. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to talk about saving wisdom, but I don't know how I'm going to fare with this ongoing festive combat with Doc. <clears throat> Lent is a time for observing the brilliance on the other side of sorrow. Just as brilliance is not the absence of sorrow, but the intimations of connectivity as darkness eases into dawn, so also is love not the absence of animus. Still more, it is not the inklings of love that flower from within us and then wane as we age. Rather, we cobble together love from this image and that sound, this enigma and that absurdity, this dusk and that dawn, until suddenly a spirit appears unexpectedly never before having been manifest. There it is, a connectivity, unaccountable, a triumph, an exaltation. Lent is the vigil we keep in waiting for the darkness to cease and a breath of connectivity to appear. Now, <clears throat> When we got into this project together, you were very generous indeed in allowing me to lead you down the path <coughs> of a liturgy known as the Great Vigil of Easter that falls between the <coughs> observances of Maundy Thursday and Easter Sunday. It's usually Saturday late night or Sunday or early morning, but in the so-called tridium, that three-day period, the vigil was considered to be the high point. And that obviously attracted my attention. And I tried to figure out, well, why? And the answer that I've been sharing with you is that it is a recitation of discrete events of holy history that pave the way for us to understand what Easter is. I mentioned last week that there are two traditions, one that starts with an understanding of what Easter is and then views holy history through that lens. The other tradition, which is the one I'm pursuing, is you start with holy history and from that you are led into the mystery of the resurrection. I've tried to illustrate that by sharing with you great works of art and I did so at the outset by <coughs> starting the story with the Michelangelo um, <clears throat> painting on the Sistine Chapel in which the light is separated from darkness. And we moved from that story of creation, which we usually think of as, and God was pleased and God was pleased and God rested, except at the end, God is unsettled and we move to the flood. 
Then this is Noah's Ark. And this is a remarkable painting, again, in the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo, in which <clears throat> the suffering is foregrounded and the promise of salvation is in the background, the promise of deliverance. So it begins to say something about the connectivity that we've been talking about. That in the midst of sorrow and sadness, there are hints, intimations, little signs of brightness that are the contours of this new connectivity. And that connectivity is a sense of the wholeness of our life as creatures in relation to God. Now, I've used the word connectivity because some of the words that we ordinarily use, like relationship with God or creatures, and we have become so accustomed to them that they don't really ring any particular way. They just, yep, yep, there's the creation. But when I say to you that what comes into view is a connectivity, it's a way of talking about the love that we feel that takes hold of us and transforms us. And once you sense it, you can't deny it, but it's virtually impossible to put into words. So my point is that each of these stories try to point to the impossibility of putting this connectivity into words because it, it exceeds comprehension. So for example, if we move next to the <coughs> slide of the story of Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac. <coughs> this is one of the most difficult stories to imagine. There's a great deal of confidence that's usually expressed in the promise that God will provide. But <coughs> Caravaggio captures the fact that that's uneasy news for Isaac, who's terrified. Uneasy news for Abraham, who's virtually about to cut his throat. And there's only at the last minute an intervention. And you may recall that some of the slides that we looked at, some of the paintings that we looked at, had Abraham completely confused by the intervention. All of which is to say that the d different paintings at which we look emphasize different ways of telling the story. So I'm pushing back against what could be called a fixed interpretation. I used the word literal interpretation and got myself in trouble with somebody last week. And I said, well, what I mean by that <coughs> is that these are poetic narratives. And there are so many different ways to read them. And that enriches the meaning of the word. So we're not really in a battle about literal or non-literal. We're in a battle, and it's not really a battle, we're expanding the meaning of literal. How does the word work? How do we understand the word? How does it take hold of us? How do we find our way through it? <coughs> now, the Yahwist, which is a fancy theological term for the presumed author of Genesis and Exodus. Um, theological scholars, I'm sorry to say I'm one, make a career out of making things a lot more complicated than they need to be. So we have a very elegant theory about the multiple authorship of the various books of the Old Testament. And some people think that represents different emphases. Some people think that represents 
different texts that were woven together really doesn't make much difference. The point here is that whoever the author was of these early narratives, we're going to call symbolically the Yahwist. And he offered countless narratives of exaltation, all of which revolve around the paradoxical and the incomprehensible connectivity between humans and God. Stories of separating light from darkness and of bringing forth the goodness of life were paired with accounts of the flood, of Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac, and the exodus from Egypt through the Red Sea. These stories illustrate that's an interesting painting, which I should point out is also in the Sistine Chapel at the back of it, and this is the deliverance through the Red Sea. These stories illustrate the themes of close human relationship with the soil, of human separation from God by overstepping the boundaries between human and divine realms, and of human's progressive corruption culminating in the flood or in the wilderness experience connected with the flood. Even so, all of these stories are punctuated with themes of deliverance. So to sense that connectivity is simultaneously to sense deliverance. It's a deliverance from our alienation, from our separation, from our cut-offness, from our wandering in lostness. Now, Isaiah portrays God as inviting us to incline our ears and to come into his presence to hear that our souls might live. I'm going to read you a little passage from Isaiah, Isaiah 55, 1 to 11. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come. Buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. So you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that you do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways. Let the unrighteous their thoughts. Then let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. But my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my Lord ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that which goes out from my mouth it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The invitation to all who thirst to come to the waters, to those who have no money to buy and eat, 
to buy wine and milk without money and without price is easily and often misread to mean an invitation to feasting and a promise of abundant life. But if we tarry, we discover that Isaiah's words run in an entirely different direction. Why, he asks, are you spending your money on what is not bread? Why are you laboring on what does not satisfy? Isaiah's prohibitions against pious posturing appear yet again, as does his admonition that the word of God is not the word of humans. The ways of God, not the ways of humans. Isaiah puts these words in the mouth of God. My ways are higher than yours, just as my thoughts are higher than yours. The heavens are higher than the earth. Forswear your foolish ways, cries the prophet on behalf of the Lord. And you may read, remember that when we opened on Ash Wednesday, we talked about Isaiah saying essentially the same thing. <clears throat> you're making loud noises, you're shaking your fists, but you're missing the point. And if that wasn't enough, Matthew comes in and condemns all the post post pious posturing and condemns the ways in which we repeat all sorts of things to show off how religious we are. What they're trying to say, and what I think one of the themes that runs through these readings is, we become so lost in the trappings that we no longer see the word. We no longer see the living word, which is that connectivity. We no longer participate in the living love of God. Instead, we forget that the word of God is not the word of humans, that the ways of God are not the ways of humans. The Lord God alone delivers us. We keep thinking we can deliver ourselves. Isaiah says, no, we are wholly incapable of knowing in which way we are to turn, even when we, acting religiously and believing that we are hearing the word, think that we do know what it is to act religiously. It is abundantly clear that Isaiah thinks that we have neither eye to see nor ears to hear. For him, and this is the important point, the history of deliverance is fundamentally one of reorienting the eye and the ear, opening the corridors to the heart that it might receive the grace of God's love. Now, it's fascinating to see how this has been represented. And so we begin with our first slide, which is Michelangelo's depiction of Isaiah. And then we move to an earlier representation in which it becomes clear that what's going on is that Isaiah is taking down the words that God is speaking to him. This is a painting by Giovanni Tieplo. It was done in the 18th century. In our next painting, a remarkable way of seeing Isaiah as a scribe. Uh, this is a painting by John Mostart in 1512. But you see the point is that he's understood to be writing down a word that has been given to him. The next is a 17th century painting of Isaiah's vision. That's, it's actually a woodcut by Matthias Marion the Elder. 
so you have this way in which the word is being brought, but this actually captures the earlier part of the vision, which is in Isaiah 6, where the ember is being brought. But the ember which sears him is also a form of the word. It is what God sends to cleanse Isaiah. The next one is one of my favorites. It's by Chagall. Mark Chagall was a Jewish painter, and this is his interpretation of the call of Isaiah, and that was in, painted in 1968. But here you get the sense of <clears throat> his heart being changed. Chagall really picks up on it. The changing of the heart, which means Isaiah is seeing and hearing things differently. There's a famous passage at the end of Isaiah 6 in which Isaiah asks the Lord how long it will be before what he preaches will be heard. And the Lord responds to him and he says, well, the first point, they're not going to hear you. And the second point is never. They will never hear you. Now, that can sound really desolate, or it can be a very deep point, which is the point of Lent, that we have to observe that which we cannot comprehend, but to which we witness. So the word is spoken, but if we think we understand what the word means, we are subject to great temptation that our interpretation will become an idol around which we gather. Yeah. Yeah. This is a foretelling um, because Chagall is part of the tradition that thinks, um, and there's a large tradition that says, with, with a good sense of humor, that Isaiah is the fifth gospel. That so often Christian um, literature invokes Isaiah as ways to interpret itself. And there are those who would hold that sometimes Christians reinterpret Isaiah to inform their views or reinforce their views. But this is the whole business of finding one's way when one's lost. And that is a theme that comes up in the wilderness experience, but it's also a theme that comes up in Jesus' testing in the wilderness. It's, it's a theme that belongs to Elijah. It belongs to um, Moses. Um, it belongs um, to Isaiah. Um, all are tested. All wander. And that it was his reference. It's one of the things about Chagall. Um, as a Jew, he does with his painting what is done frequently in uh, Jewish scriptural interpretation. It's called midrashic, and it's this writing that goes on in the margins. So the wonderful thing about this, and, and in a sense, you know, that's what we're doing here. We're writing in the margins. Um, I'm expanding what's written by using these paintings and then offering an interpretation which brings more dimensions to the, the word expands what is entailed in the word and expands then what the literal is understood to mean. It in, it in literally the immensity of the word contains all of these things. Uh, this is a fascinating, this next one is a really fascinating um, interpretation of um, Come to the Waters. Uh, this is a, a painting by a man who just recently died, and a man who I had the good fortune to know fairly well for a number of years, a painter by the name of John Swenson. And this is his interpretation of the call of Isaiah, but what he's doing is focusing on um, the waters, the waters that will feed, the waters that will provide drink. Uh, it's, it's just remarkable. So it's a call to, to make available the plentitude of life. This is an early um, print about the call of Isaiah. Um, this is an interesting print. Um, 
which the next one, I wanted to go to the next one, um, <coughs> which helps us to see the way in which Isaiah becomes more or less the fifth gospel. You have uh, the prophets um, of um, <coughs> Isaiah and Jeremiah um, <coughs> alongside um, the nativity. So the whole business of Isaiah is a foretelling, and of Jeremiah is a foretelling of the coming of the Christ event. So there's a sign, and this is an early work. This is done a man by the name of Duccio, and he painted this in the early 14th century, 1305. Now, I'm moving from Isaiah to a, um, series of writings um, by a minor prophet named Baruch. And Doc was so sweet, he said to me, <coughs> uh, David, not many people know who Baruch is. He said, I know you know, but I said, there not many people know who Baruch is. And of course, I always think that I don't know anything any more than anybody else, so I was incredulous. So I did a little quick sample and nobody knew who was <laughs> um, Baruch was. Now, <clears throat> that piqued my curiosity, you can imagine that. So I started to dig. And the problem goes back as far as um, Jerome, who compiled the Vulgate. And he did so for Pope Damasus. And Damasus and Jerome were working around 325, the time of the Nicene Creed. And so <coughs> the things that got into the Vulgate were Trinitarian, and the things that weren't Trinitarian didn't make it. And the clear reading on the part of Jerome was that Baruch didn't make it. But four editions later, it, there it was in the Vulgate. And so it's gone back and forth. The present status is that <coughs> the Orthodox <coughs> tradition and the Roman Catholic tradition refer to Baruch as, here's a big word for you, deuterocanonical, which means another canon, a second canon, it's not the canon. So we always see Bruce a little bit on the outside. That, that, that's really what we need to know. He's an outsider. And the Protestants, not wishing to be outdone, um, <coughs> said that um, Bruce part of the Apocrypha. So we have a way of having him in and out all at the same time. But that's part of the charm and then the part all right, I'm, I'm standing up and I'm saluting. This is almost as good as not having batteries Sunday morning, Doc. You know, wow. Okay, so um, Baruch is part of the vigil. So then you have to kind of ask yourself, well, why is this outsider part of the vigil? And that's because. Baruch has some very strong things to say, and I'm gonna share them with you. Um, fortunately, they're not that hard to hear. Um, <clears throat> hear the commandments of life, O Israel. Give ear and learn wisdom. Why is it, O Israel, why is it that you are in the land of your enemies? That you are growing old in a foreign country? that you are defiled with the dead, that you are counted among those in Hades. You have forsaken the fountain of wisdom. If you had walked in the way of God, you would have been living in peace forever. Learn where there is wisdom, where there is strength, where there is understanding, so that you may at the same time discern where there is length of days in life, where there is light for the eyes and peace. Who has found her place? Who has entered her storehouses? But the one who knows all things knows her. He found her by his understanding. 
The one who prepared the earth for all time filled it with four-footed creatures, the one who sends forth the light, and it goes. He called it and obeyed him. Trembling, the stars shone in their watches and were glad. He called them, and they said, Here we are. They shone with gladness for him who made them. This is our God. No other can be compared to him. He found the whole way to knowledge and gave her to his servant Jacob. Okay, hear that. Knowledge is a she. Sophia. Gave the whole way to knowledge, gave her to the servant Jacob and to Israel, whom he loved. Afterward, she appeared on earth and lived with humankind. She became tabernacled. She, wisdom, Sophia, is the book of the commandments of God. Now, this is really, really remarkable. I'm going to interrupt just for a moment to say, this is the living commandments, the living ordering of God. It's not tablets with scratches. This is the living word that comes to earth. The commandments are understood as a way of living, a way of loving. She is the book of the commandments of God, the law that endures forever, and all who hold her fast will live, and those who forsake her will die. Turn, O Jacob, and take her. Walk toward the shining of her light. Do not give your glory to another or your advantages to an alien people. Happy are we, O Israel. Now, Baruch is peripheral. And in my mind, he's a lot like the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, you may remember the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. He, he's the back of the crowd. And he keeps jumping up and down, trying to get a word in. And all the, the highfalutin church people drown him out. But he keeps trying to get a word in, and it, he's got the word that they need to hear. That's why Baru is here. He's got the word we have to hear. And <clears throat> he says, you've failed to tend to God's word. And you are numbered now among the waning, the dead. We think we, we know what we're doing. We think we're going, you know, looking in all the right places, doing all the right things. I says, no. 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 You are among the dead. So he takes Isaiah one step further. By the way, I, I, I did not mention and should have mentioned and that's what this painting is. Baruch is the scribe who takes down what Jeremiah says. But it's fairly well established that he did write this book. So, the wisdom of God has, that God has given has appeared on the earth. She's appeared in the form of the commandments. She's lived among the people. Those who will hold fast the shining of her light might yet live. Unless we give our glory to another. Now they've got the crux of the matter. We are drawn again and again to pay attention to things that aren't the word. They're so seductive. Doc and I were talking about this earlier, that one of the reasons people aren't going to church is they don't think they need to because they've got so much money. They don't need to be humble. They don't need to worry about being God's people. They're too busy running things. It was a really important point. That's what Baruch is saying. It's so easy to get lost. Even though we long to... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. To see the light, we give our glory to another, and then ra rarely do we see the light rightly. <coughs> Excuse me. Even though we long to escape the spell cost, cast over us by time, and to escape the imprisoned longing, our insistent 
insistence upon dispensation is faint. Our hope to be innocent just one more time, frail. We seem able to remember only what used to be and not to hope for lavish blooming. And so we wait for what is fading out and coming back again after a while and then it goes and we wait again for its coming until waiting is all that is left with love sometimes leaving and sometimes being taken away. So we wait silently, waiting for the best to come yet again. But the allure of silence always distracts us. We get lost. We don't notice the breathing. We miss the connectivity that appears right in our midst because we are looking elsewhere. That connectivity is a perfect shimmering that has been there all along. The Lord's with me on this one. <laughs> I really am grateful when God backs me up on these points. I was looking over at Doc, he's saying, oh man, where's he going? And the Lord's spoken, that's it, all right. All who hold fast to her will live. That's what Baruch says. And that's been seconded by the Lord. Now we take a look at a few ways in which Baruch has been pictured. The fascinating thing is that he is often interpreted as a, an expression of a, a kind of paradise. And so what you have is um, the Bruegel's. This is John Broyle the Younger, who did Paradise, and this is in 1650. And then you have um, John Broyle the Elder, that's his father, did this in 1603. But notice he sees this, this idyllic space. You know, <clears throat> if you'd walked in the way of the little God, the fountain of wisdom, you'd be living in peace forever. This is where there's length of days in life, light for eyes and peace. All right, this is how it's articulated. Now, this is um, Jean Bruegel the Younger, another one in 1638. And this is really fascinating, the next one, which is, Bruegel painting alongside Pierre Paul Rubens. Now you've heard of Rubens. And what they do is they put paradise and our inability to see paradise in one place. So they put the Adam and Eve story right there. And it's all about an inability to see. All about an inability to see where there is wisdom and where there is strength. This one fascinates me. This is... Um, Giotto's way of talking about Baruch and this paradise, and for him, it's the presentation. This, Giotto is an early painter um, of the Renaissance. He was Chimbui's student, and the most remarkable thing is to go to the church of St. Francis of Assisi um, in Italy, and it's got two parts of the building. Lower level is frescoes, on the right side, the story of Christ. On the left side, the story of St. Francis. And they, they're parallel, and they go through the same movements. And you get to the front, and you have Christ carrying the cross, and you have Francis carrying the cross with him. It's really remarkable. So this is a whole, imagine being <laughs> a pilgrim and, and visiting this church and seeing these remarkable paintings. Just stunning. And, and, the, and the message is, Francis is the second Christ. And there's ways about it. And so you go, come away with this great sense of the Christ figure is Francis. Francis is the Christ figure. They're, they're indissolubly linked. You go upstairs and you have 
the story of Christ, and that's done by both Chambui and Giotto. So you have these two great minds, master and student, painting. And you can see how Chimbui was breaking away from the Byzantine, but you get to Giotto and the figures become far more human. It's, it's stunning. Um, this is a painting uh, called The Indwelling of the Word. And that was when I wanted to, I wanted to point up that this is a way to illustrate the power of the commandment being the living word coming to dwell amongst us. So it dwells here in the kingdom, in the tabernacle. This is another smaller version. Um, and that completes what I wanted to say about Baruch and about Isaiah and their invitation for us to see again that the wisdom is not that we've heard the word. The wisdom is that the word comes to us and we hear it not. And only when we acknowledge that we've not heard it are our hearts opened enough to receive the grace of God. So this is the whole trajectory, the whole sojourn of the observance of Lent is a pathway of humility, of recognizing that we don't know. The great mystery is beyond our comprehension, but it comes to us. And when it comes to us, it's indisputable, but we can't ah, put it into words. Our hearts are transformed. And we see what it is to love one another by entering into a loving relationship. And that's what we are attempting to observe in Lent. Thank you. Thank you. Who are our biblical characters next week? Oh, we are doing the dry bones. All the right. Valley of dry bones. The Valley of Dry Bones. Bring your Bible thesaurus yeah, and yeah. imagination so next it, Wednesday. It, it, it is, and in fact, I had to be careful because I've been working on it all day. And I was almost about to spill over the thought of Ezekiel. Mm. But no, this sets us up for Ezekiel. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a hint. If they, if B Isaiah said we were in a foreign country, if Baruch said, you're dead, you're in Hades, Ezekiel says, gets put down right in the middle, and you're not only dead, you're gone. I mean, it's bones that have been there for so long, they're totally dried out. This is how bad the state is. And then the question, shall these bones live yet again. And Ezekiel has the wisdom to say, thou alone dost knowest that. 